Hello, hello, and welcome to Open Tech Will Save Us. I'm going to ask uh, everybody in the Matrix room if you can hear me. Okay, if you can hear my microphone, please. Please shout, even if there is some delay. So I can launch the proper introduction for Open Tech Will Save Us. You can hear me, wonderful. All right. So welcome to this episode of Open Tech Will Save Us in which we try to understand the social impact of software and how open source can make it more positive. Today is the release day for Thunderbird 102. My guest is Ryan, the Community and Business Development Manager for Thunderbird. We have a lot to talk about. Improved navigation, a massive and gorgeous redesign, matrix integration, of course, but also the amazing collaboration with K9 to make Thunderbird Mobile happen. I have plenty of questions for Ryan, but feel free to send yours in our matrix chat as well. If you're watching this episode live on YouTube, you will find a link in the matrix chat uh, to the matrix chat in the description. Let's get started. Ryan, can you introduce yourself? And as silly as it sounds, can you tell us what is Thunderbird? Uh Okay, well, um, first off, I'm Ryan. Um, my title actually did change earlier this year. I'm the product and business development manager for Thunderbird. And um, I, uh, I was the community manager for what, for almost four years um, on the Thunderbird project. And uh, beyond that, um, I spent some time uh, on the Thunderbird Council, which is the community governance body for Thunderbird. It, it actually is a very powerful community um, governance body. It makes most of the decisions about what happens with, with Thunderbird. Um, and I served as treasurer on that body. Um, the Thunderbird is an open source um, email, chat, address book. Uh, there's quite a bit here. Um, address book. Uh, I'm trying to think what are the big ones. RSS reader. Um, it's a it's a massive um, communications client and personal information management client, and it's been around for twenty years, <laughs> so it's been around for a very long time, um, and has a very large user base. We have twenty million um, monthly active users, and uh, a lot of people really love it. That's very cool. I've been using uh, Thunderbird personally for years. I I think I was still very young when it was first released uh, because it, 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 it's been following Firefox. Uh, it was another project uh, that came after Firefox. And I remember I was a kid when Firefox uh, was first created. Um, you describe, you use, I think, personal information manager. That sounds a little enterprisey. Can, can you tell us who is Thunderbird for? Um, I think Thunderbird is is really um, for a lot of different types of users. Um, the, we do have some large enterprises using Thunderbird, um, especially a, a couple of governments are using Thunderbird at scale. So you have a very different use case there than you have for just your average user. But, you know, uh, there are also a ton of just your average user. They're just trying to manage multiple email accounts and Thunderbird is is the way that they find it easiest to do that. And so um, oftentimes I hear this allows me to put all my calendars, all my contacts, all my email in one place and kind of manage that. And so it goes it goes all the way from um, open source enthusiasts to small business owner up to to governments. And it's a very hard line to walk to keep all of those people happy. But um, but at the same time, uh, because we have uh, a pretty large community and even our user base is pretty active, somewhat active on providing a lot of feedback to us, we're at least able to to understand where the gaps are and <laughs> try our best to to keep up with, with our users and their needs. Right. I remember a designer telling me when you are trying to talk to everybody, you are actually talking to nobody. So it's, it's pretty cool to see you are able to narrow down uh, to get a few categories, um, the, the government, the average open source user, maybe different types of users. Um, I'm going to be a bit provocative, but what is so exciting about an email client in 2022? Don't we have enough email clients? Yeah, um, for me, when I, I was 
what brought me to Thunderbird was I was working at um, System76 and they make Linux computers and uh, computers with Linux pre-installed. And uh, I remember someone, a customer called in and they were deploying them at a, um, at a university at scale. And um, they were asking, okay, like, uh, if I were deploying a bunch of Windows machines today, I would have Outlook, you know, on on all of them. Um, what should we be using as kind of an Outlook alternative? And uh, I looked around and, uh, you know, there was not a great <laughs> Outlook alternative. Um, the truth is, I think, when you're using email and you're communicating a lot, email and calendar and address book, all these things kind of, I, I use the blanket email, but when you're using these, sometimes if you're, if you're a heavy communicator, like, like I am in my role and like, you know, quite a few different people and in, in their roles, they've got a ton of email coming in. They're talking to a lot of people. You need a power tool. Um, and Gmail is not a power tool. Um, there are a lot of, these web applications that the web applications for email like Gmail, like um, even to some extent Office 365, that they they have a lot of limitations just because of the technology, because of the scope of what the team is trying to do. And um, so to your earlier question, which this ties in to I, I see Thunderbird as a power tool for communications. And um, and that seems to be with our users, that seems to be the thread that goes through all of them is is a, a lot of our users are, they're trying, they're there to use a power tool. They need something that they have some level of customization over that they can define their workflows. And um, and for me, I, I went to Thunderbird thinking, okay, this is a gap. At the time it was a gap for the Linux desktop. Um, but as I dug into it more, I realized, no, this is just a gap, you know, across maybe uh, c computing um, that we need more powerful communication tools because the the volume of communication we're getting is not going down. <laughs> and um, the uh, the I guess, because of just that, the volume, it's becoming harder and harder to stay on top of all the incoming. And, and uh, so ultimately, I tell my team all the time that uh, eventually, I would like Thunderbird to be powerful enough that it's like having someone sitting there with you going through your email and helping you, you know, not just email, but chat too but just going through your communication channels and helping you manage all those incoming communications. Right, you're, you're touching uh, many topics actually. Uh, email is surprisingly difficult to do. Uh, we could think that IMAP uh, and SMTP are standards that are old enough that now we know how to do email. It's really hard to do, to do properly. Uh, there are so many edge cases, uh, of course. Um, another thing that is very difficult to do is calendaring. Um, every time you have to manage dates as a programmer, uh, you freak out. So not all sorts of dates as a programmer, but especially time related dates. Um, it, it's very difficult. You never want to have to deal with time zones. Calendars are a nightmare. So it's super useful to, to have a tool uh, that is able to handle that properly for you. I, that's one of the things I really like with Thunderbird. You you have a very sturdy product that is able to link uh, things together. So it does make a lot, a lot of sense uh, for me to get your emails, uh, which are your asynchronous communication linked to your calendar, because most of the time you use email, well, not necessarily most of the time, but sometimes you use your email to uh, book appointments with people. So you it does make sense uh, to get a link w between your email and your calendar to be able to know when you are available. 
uh, but it also makes sense to get your contact list uh, in, in the same software because the people you are communicating with are the people you are probably going to get um, meetings and appointments uh, with. And I really like uh, that vision of trying to go beyond those basics. So for example, the RSS feeds, uh, it might be a little surprising and, and sound like you are trying to do too much, but it's really trying to catch up with all the information you have. Um, and and, and in, in this uh, 102 release, you added a uh, matrix in the instant messaging section. That instant messaging section already existed. Uh, I think it supported IC before. Did it support all the um, information, uh, instantaneous yeah. messaging platform? XMPP, um, IRC, uh, Google Talk, although I think that becomes more and more difficult every day. And um, for a while, Facebook and Twitter uh, were all supported um, there. Now, uh, I think our team has generally agreed that Matrix is kind of the future that we want to believe in and that we want to allow users to, of course, XMPP is also popular among Quite, quite a few of our more enterprise users, but um, the for me, I think Matrix, and we we touched on this briefly before we hopped on the call, but uh, but I think Matrix is an amazing standard, and I think it's super cool piece of technology, and and not only that, but it's it's really enjoyable <laughs> to use, um, and so we're trying to see, we're trying to look at not only how can we provide a great matrix experience? But also, is there a way we can introduce our users to matrix, our existing users to matrix and get them using this standard to communicate with each other? And we don't have like super concrete plans at the moment for how we can do that, but we're constantly talking about it and thinking about it. So hopefully some good stuff will come, will come out of that in the near future. So yeah, ma matrix is very exciting to us and it is a part of our plans for the future. And I wanted to also touch on this, um, this uh, you know, doing too much stuff. We we talk about that quite a lot. Of course, um, contacts, calendar, email, and uh, address book. Uh, well, I guess that's contacts. Uh, those are all really interrelated. Like you, the, you can't really do have a great experience and e great email experience unless you also have calendar and address book at your disposal. That's my conviction, at least, is that without those, it, you'll feel like something critical is missing. So so those are, are not really out of scope. And you touch in just working on email stuff, you touch on <laughs> these related issues. Um, RSS and chat. Chat, to me, is is adjacent enough that you're still talking about communication, being productive with your communication it's um, it's technically asynchronous, but it's often much more real time than than email. But uh, it's definitely if we're going to be relevant five or ten years from now, I feel like it needs to be a part of of what we're providing to users. And I really dislike the idea that we'll live in a future where the, um, everyone's using a closed standard like Discord or or even WhatsApp, you know, or something like that. I'd like to provide some solution that isn't, you know, some walled garden type deal. Um, and then, uh, and then our SSB that that has stuck with us for a while. Um, it's very useful to many of our users, and it's not an incredible burden <laughs> to maintain. And even may we might give it a little bit of a facelift. Here soon, but even that in the scheme of things is not the largest, you know, time suck of all the things that we could be doing. And so, um, you know, the we don't the I don't think the team really feels like it's too spread thin other than by uh these past few years was just paying down technical debt from having a platform that spent a few years without really great, you know. A, a big time investment keeping up with with the stuff that just needed to happen and so that has probably been our biggest you know thing that we've had to spend time on that that we'd rather have been working on 
giving our users more things in front of their face that they could use and that made them more productive. But we're at this point where we're stable enough and we're past a lot of the technical debt. And so we're actually able to deliver real things for users. That's very cool. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, you want a competitor that's uh, to WhatsApp and Discord that is using an open standard um, to get open communications um, and decentralized, hopefully. Um, you also mentioned a facelift. UX is a very important aspect uh, to onboarding users and, and making them stay. Uh, to work on UX, you had to pay tech debt first to have enough um, freedom to shuffle things around in, in the UI and in the code behind. Today is the release of Thunderbird 102, uh, which has great redesign, I believe. Can you tell us more about all the shiny new things uh, that are brought by this release? Sure. Address book got totally rewritten and uh, it's a lot cleaner now. It's a lot, it's very beautiful. It's also just has a lot of quality of life features that our old address book didn't have. Um, for one that is that eventually I'd like to expose in other places. If you add someone's time zone um, to their to their contact profile, you can actually, if you go and look at it, you can see what time it is in there, you know, where they're at. Um, there are uh, just a ton of Interesting things like relationship management in the address book, you can set up relationships so you can see, okay, so-and-so is the manager of so-and-so, or this person is the wife of <laughs> this other person. And and I think stuff like that is really useful um, just in practice day to day. And, and the address book, I feel like is a place where, you know, you should be able to keep all that information you gain about a contact and uh, some place that you can look and kind of almost like your notes about a person just see, okay, what do I know about this person? Maybe you haven't spoken to them for a while. You need a refresher in who they are and, and what they're up to. And, and that's what we wanted to provide as a, is kind of a one-stop place to just keep track of the people you communicate with and, and understand who they are. Um, that is a preview for the rest of our redesign. This time we managed to get in some things like the method header is completely customizable and has some really great options. Um, and uh, and the that work is just the beginning of a redesigned mail tab or what we call mail tab, a redesigned email part of Thunderbird that is um, that is just more helpful. Um, if you a lot, uh, some people will be very upset at me for saying this. But Thunderbird is very information dense. Like it's just it's it, there. Your eye is not necessarily drawn to any particular place where you can see that this information is more important than this other information, which is a bit of a problem because there are there is information when you're looking at your list of emails that is more important than other information. Who sent the email? What's the subject? Those are probably the most two two most important pieces of information you can get from an email. Um, Thunderbird uh, just has for a long time not really done much to, you know, make it easier on your brain to process, you know, your list of emails. And so in the next release, we're going to, in this release, we moved a little bit towards that. And in the next release, you'll see quite a bit more um, work on just making sure that you can quickly go through your email manage it and see, try and better triage like what's important and what isn't. And that comes in the form of right now, if you look at Thunderbird, there's just this, these lines, that's your email list is just one straight line. And it's got, you know, who it came from subject, um, you know, these different flags on it, date it was sent. And of course, we're going to make it possible and it will be default um, to do multi-line so it will have the author, it will have the subject, maybe a brief, you know, preview of what's in the email and uh, that and other information, but laid out in a way that's much more digestible. Of course, for all the people who love Thunderbird as it currently exists, um, 
just by right clicking and customizing you'll be able to change it back to the old way if you if you see fit um, to do so and so but the but the idea with um, the redesign of of that section and also calendar is going to get a little bit of a, a facelift as well is just to make it so that you can quickly get through the information that you're being presented with because it's if you're if you're a heavy user like I am of calendar and and, and mail you see like it can be overwhelming to see just lots and lots just wall of text essentially especially with email you know that it's very hard to quickly make decisions about that and we're going to be trying to provide a better user experience so that you can more quickly get through that information make decisions and move on to things other than email in your day yeah uh, you touched on several interesting things here again um i could spend the night discussing it <laughs> uh, you you mentioned um so the importance of ux and you said it's going to be on by default i really love that you are trying to make sane defaults so customization for people who need it but sane default they, this is really uh really great and beyond ux uh i think there is something else which is quite important is how vibrant uh, Thunderbird is at the moment. I think a few people left uh, Thunderbird a few years ago when the project seemed to be nearly dormant. Uh, we're going to talk about that in greater length afterwards, but it's really exciting to see that there seems to be movement funding, people walking um, on Thunderbird improvements coming. So it's, it's really exciting to see that in action. We have a first few questions um, in the chat. Somebody is asking, do you have Firefox sync integration in the roadmap with Thunderbird? Uh, and what is the scope? Is it just the configuration of Thunderbird, uh, synchronization of contacts, RSS, etc.? What is the scope? And is it uh, on the roadmap? It is on the roadmap. I, I, I was curious if that was one of my own team members asking that question, but <laughs> the... <laughs> Um, we're currently uh, actually starting work on that here, probably this this month or or early um, not this month. This is June, but early July or 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 by the latest, I would imagine August. Um, but the uh, but yes, we intend to bring Firefox Sync into um, Thunderbird. Of course, um, for for those of you who don't know, Firefox Sync is end to end encrypted. Um, syncing technology that, that Firefox uses. Um, we are also going to be able to use it. And uh, what we want to do is sync um, sync account settings. We're not going to be syncing like the mail itself because that can be quite crazy. <laughs> um, but the account settings will at least allow you to account settings, um, tags, fil well, you don't need to think tags. That's part of IMAP. But account settings, filters, um, other things like that that kind of arrange Thunderbird in the way that you had it customized. These these types of application level settings are um, are really important to us, and and we want you to be able to move to a new computer, plug in um, Firefox Sync, and have it come out the way that the other computer you were just on uh, you, that you had it configured. And then this is really important too because because we, uh, which I know we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but because K9 Mail joined our family, um, now you do the kind of, there's this conception now of like a user could be on desktop and then move to mobile and they need the same, some of the same settings in both of those places um, if they want a consistent mail experience. And so it's really important, not just for, you know, moving to different computers or a multi-computer -com uh, home, but it's um, it's also about like, okay, when I move to my phone, I need everything to behave in the same way so that I'm most productive. And so, um, yeah, that work is starting very soon, and and um, hopefully, if you're on the beta, you'll see that. I would I would hope sometime in the fall, but at the latest, like in, in near the end of the year. Right, you mentioned the beta. Uh, if some Thunderbird developers are in the chat, please uh, send instructions to install the beta. 
If not, we are going to send them after the episode. Uh, really, if you go to thunderbird.net, there's a beta button right at the top of the page. And so you can you can grab the beta from there. Um, simple and straightforward. Yep. Yeah. All right. You, you mentioned K9 uh, very quickly for people who are not Android users. So K9 is a very popular open source email client on Android. Um, there was a collaboration announced between K9 and Thunderbird. We are going to talk about that a bit later. We have a few questions uh, from the community we need to address. So for XMPP, what is the status of Omemo integrations? So Omemo, for people who are not familiar, is for end-to-end -end encryption over XMPP? I, I, um, I just saw a thread about this the other day. The, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I do know that <laughs> it at least is being actively discussed. So we might have support. Um, I'll, I don't know. I'll have to post something on, on Twitter or something after this once I've had a chance to, to ask. Um, XMPP is a pretty solid um, <laughs> pro chat protocol in Thunderbird, and uh, and to be honest, I haven't had to think about it for quite some time because um, we don't get a ton of uh, requests or um, or really like big bugs or anything from it. It just kind of works and the users who are using it have been using it forever and now continue to use it for a long time, I imagine. And so um, I don't know, I'll post on I'll post on Twitter after this with an answer to that question. Right. And um, so XMPP is quite stable. Uh, and that's a nice transition to the other question. There is something which is much more in active development, uh, shipping a lot of features already. But somebody is asking how much of the standard is Thunder of the matrix standard is Thunderbird implementing? Uh, eventually, hopefully, uh, all of it. <laughs> um, it it's uh, an ongoing um, thing. Also, the standard is not um, the standard is not standing still itself, <laughs> and so it's it's um, a pretty rapidly moving target itself. Not in a bad way. I mean, we. And there's at least compatibility doesn't break compatibility um, uh, very often, it, but you know it's uh, it's something that um, we're trying to move quickly on to implement. Event we'd like to get to all of it. Of course, I feel like, and this is a good thing. As soon as we get to all of it, there will be more, you know, to to implement. And so, um, but we do have uh, quite a few um, folks who actually work um, for Element who are in the Thunderbird community who help us to, to do that. And so um, our goal is 100%. And, uh, and I, I, hope that, I hope we can get there. Um, I, I see stuff moving closer and closer every day. Um, uh, just uh, the other day, uh, just uh, it's a little one, but just somebody was like, yeah, we're, we're working on reactions, you know, to messages, which is something that, um, is it, it, it makes forces us to have to change Thunderbird because right now the Thunderbird chat area doesn't really support that type of you know message reaction um, inter interaction and so we have to develop that to be able to you know get that part of the the standard in but uh but we're hoping to you know I don't I can't give an exact timeline but I'm hoping we can get get much much closer to what you might experience an element in the in the next year or two. Yeah, software projects are never done. Uh, anyway, so uh, you are never going to be finished, done, uh, and, and moving to the next thing. There will always be a next thing uh, to implement. Um, you mentioned an interesting thing, uh, which is fallbacks. Um, that's one of the features I quite like about Matrix. Obviously, I'm a little biased, maybe because I'm employed by Element. Um, but uh, yes, I, I do like that in the protocol we have fallbacks so that when clients are did not yet implement a thing, they still have a way to render thing uh, things so the user are not completely left out of the loop uh, because they are using an experimental uh, or young early client. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question about O365 support or integration. Do you plan to have that in Thunderbird? It yeah, it depends on on so 
Office 365 Exchange, um, these things are um, complicated issues. And I and to to be frank, I would like to make them much less complicated issues. Um, the right now we have different ways to to use um, these services. Um, and it, you'll have to excuse me for when I talk about Exchange and Office 365 as if they're one. I know there there are differences, but but there are also a lot of similarities in that um, these are not uh, generally open protocols. And depending on how the administrator has set up, you know, your session, and I'm talking mostly about schools and and enterprises where people get introduced to these services a lot. You know, sometimes they don't allow the use of, of IMAP. Um, and so you have to use their EWS um, uh, closed um, proprietary protocol, which we don't support out of the box. Maybe we will in the, in the near-ish future, but we're still having that discussion. And it's not an easy, to, it's not an easy discussion because we would really love to live in a world where these service providers, you know, also support the open standard for clients. Um, but, uh, you know, probably, um, and I am reaching out to a couple people at Microsoft, but probably they won't <laughs> care what I have to say on the subject is my, is my um, suspicion. Um, but, uh, Ultimately, um, that's not really the user's problem, and we'd like to make it so that um, a user of any email service can come over and use it in Thunderbird. Um, so I hope to make that much, much easier and a much better story. At the moment, I all I can say is it's complicated, but it's, it's something that we're constantly talking about and looking into and trying to figure out the best way forward for our users. So I am not a lawyer, but I know Element has been very active in the DMA work in Europe um, to make sure that the gatekeeper, the gatekeepers could not keep gatekeeping. Uh, so, so they are forced to play nice. Uh, I can easily see Microsoft falling in that. So I am not a lawyer, so I don't know if services such as email are in are in the scope of the DMA. But maybe Europe could come to the rescue here. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I'd love to see. Um, there are good people in Microsoft who do care about open standards, and um, I think that if if uh, if we can, as a maybe an open source community, reach out to those people that some of us know, and really and really ex explain how kind of bad <laughs> some of um, this this behavior is um you know the the best thing would be is if they um if these were just made open protocols um and um, i'm sure there are business reasons why that may not be what they they want to do but uh but that's the world i'd like to see if they if they don't adopt an open standard is that they they make sure that these are open and well documented and uh, so that clients can properly implement them. So t talking about uh, open protocols and email and instant messaging, uh, we have another question about, do you plan to add Delta Chat as a new chat protocol? So under the hood for people who are not familiar, uh, Delta Chat is basically using email, so I believe encrypted emails, um, mm -hmm. as a transport layer, uh, but you, having a, a, a UI that makes you think it's actually instant messaging. So do you have plans for Delta Chat in Thunderbird, uh, not only to display it as regular emails, but to have a really chat UI for uh, Delta Chat? I, so I have, I'm, I've had many conversations with the Delta Chat folks, which they are like amazing people. I have not met one person on that project who is not really, really great. Um, chat over IMAP <laughs> or chat over email. Uh, is a very complicated thing in my mind in that um, if it became part of the IMAP standard, I think that would, could be really, 
really great for it. Um, the but... well, my one complaint, and they know this, and and I think about it all the time because I was a user. Is um, you start you start messaging, we start messaging. Um, where does that email go? It is email. It's an encrypted email. Where does it go? You know, does it go in a hidden folder? Well, not every provider <laughs> kind of does the right thing with hidden folders. Um, and uh, and where what does that look like when you're on a different client that doesn't support, you know, chat over email? What's going to be the behavior um, when you're on those clients? It's it's complicated. It's very complicated because uh, what I don't want to do is introduce users to a technology where they're going to have this this folder appear and they're not going to know what it is and they're going to be on a different client. Maybe, you know, they go from Thunderbird to the web, you know, mail client one day and they just go, boop, delete that. Like, I don't know what that is. It's just a bunch of garbled stuff in this folder. And then, uh, oh, all their chats are gone. And, um, and so uh, I know, I know that the community around um, chat over IMAP, chat over email, Delta chat are thinking about these questions. And it's probably come a bit from when I talked to them, which was at this point more than it's been a couple, it's been a few years at least. Um, so I'm sure it's come a long way, but I really want to make sure that, that um, when, when we're looking at this stuff, that the user story um, is really solid uh, because I'm not so worried about myself or you, uh, you know, figuring out what's happening with uh, with this, but I am very worried about um, the majority of Thunderbird users uh, and kind of how that experience is. We could go, we could take, th I, I do acknowledge that Thunderbird could, by just adopting it, could take it, you know, a long way um, forward. Uh, and I think about it all the time. So uh, if the if the Delta Chat guys or if anybody in the community wants to come, and start contributing to support that standard, we can at least get it into the chat part of um, Thunderbird, which I would be okay with. Um, and then uh, as far as pushing it to users, I think that's a bigger conversation that we have to figure out, okay, well, how do we do that? How do we do that responsibly? Um, uh, it's the same with, you know, um, and I, I won't get love for this, but it's true. It's the same with syncing via IMAP. Um, it's something that folks ask for or have asked for instead of Firefox sync. They're like, no, no, let us sync all of our settings via IMAP, which we, we are going to write an API for syncing so that people will be able to hook up, you know, an add-on or something that allows for this. But once again, that's going to be stored in a folder in IMAP. <laughs> you know, users are going to go by, they're going to, screw up that folder or other clients will screw up that folder you know things will happen to it and it's 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 very hard you look at it like what's for all these things you try to look at it for like what's the solution that's going to treat users best and going to be the best experience for them and sometimes even though the technology is is there um it's not exactly the best experience for users and and uh, so that, that's part of the calculation, at least. I love what you are saying, um, because it's making my job super easy. Um, you are saying that technology is not enough and that as engineers, we can get carried away of trying to do things just because we can, but we need to have a proper product vision and to describe it properly in a standard to make sure there is one single way to do a certain thing um, so it does not happen by accident and so the user cannot trip on on things that were technicalities but that were meant to be hidden in the interface there is one such protocol <laughs> yeah. which is matrix yeah. for instant messaging <laughs> yeah and 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 i think that um i think that we have, while I'm super excited about projects like Delta Chat and 
I think that as a community and especially as 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 Thunderbird, okay, just just speaking as Thunderbird, um, if I want to introduce them to if I want to introduce our users to chat in Thunderbird, um, I really have one chance and it has to be competitive with the other stuff out there. And I think that for my calculation, which is different than my, if I take off, you know, the Thunderbird product manager hat and I put on like my open source enthusiast hat, which I am a major open source enthusiast have been for, you know, in this community for since I was 14, like the, I, I get super excited about this stuff, but when it comes to trying to um, convince our users to use open standards, to use this technology that is more privacy respecting, like just better for them, I, I have to make sure that it's a really, really solid experience. Um, because they're comparing Thunderbird, they're not comparing Thunderbird to, you know, most of our users are not comparing Thunderbird to all these different, you know, um, open source applications that, you know, don't have a lot of market share. They're comparing, they're going to be comparing whatever we do in chat um, to Discord to, you know, WhatsApp. To, and we and we can either, right now I would say that chat is still in not the best shape in Thunderbird. And so if, they're, if they compare them today, like we're, um, a subpar, you know, product in comparison. Um, but I'm hoping that next year and the following year, we can actually give them an experience that is competitive and try to tell them, try to convince them like, okay, this, this product is better for you. It's better for your team. For instance, chat is usually a, a team type of situation. Um, and this is why you should use it and try to try to make that case. And the only way we're going to effectively make that case is by making a good, good, solid experience. All right. Uh, very detailed answer. We have a question from, uh, so it's not really a question. It's somebody called Benjamin, maybe who is part of the Thunderbird team who says, can you talk a bit about the add-on ecosystem after the big API change and your strategy moving forward? Has the community has the community healed sorry and this question is giving me ptsd as somebody involved in the gnome community uh, which is famous for extensions not being entirely official and sometimes breaking every major release well uh we in 78 we went through which was a few versions ago now like three or four years ago um three i think the uh we like we had this thing that they're essentially legacy extensions um extensions that were uh that had access to all of the application um they you could do whatever you wanted if you want to stick a button right in the middle of the screen a big red button like you can like thunderbird would not stop you um if you wanted to if you were a really bad actor, if you wanted to exfiltrate all that user's information and send it to um, some computer somewhere, like you could do that. There were no limitations on what an add-on would do and what they could access within um, Thunderbird. Um, I don't think we handled that transition the best way that we could. Um, I think it was just, it was a lot of different factors, but we could have made it easier on users um, and and been a lot more um, communicative about what was happening and why it was happening. Um, but we were still a very, very small team at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and unfortunately we were spread in a lot of different, uh, we we're just super spread thin and uh, and so that was really painful, not just for our users, but also <laughs> for everyone involved. Um, now we have really quite robust, um, they're technically web extensions, but of course there's a layer in Thunderbird on top of that, which we call mail extensions, which is all of our APIs. Um, and, uh, and some really amazing add-ons are coming out of that. 
Um, and there are there's this um, thing that, that we make available too, which is you can do an experiment, which where essentially you write an API um, for a part of Thunderbird, and then um, you can use that. You have to go through a special process where we re manually review the add-on um, to make sure it's not doing anything nefarious. But uh, the add-ons ecosystem is coming back. I think the community has healed. We did lose, you know, add-on authors um, through that transition. We did lose. Um, we probably lost users. I don't. See, I don't see that in the, in the you know update pings for Thunderbird. Uh, but I. But I do. I do think that um, if we didn't lose users, we lost goodwill, from users over that change. I think it was necessary, but I think we could have done it better. And but I, I think we're getting to a point where many of the many of the add-ons that people were using, or at least the most popular ones, um, exist in some way, shape, or form. And then the ones that don't is because we've we've merged some of those things into Core Thunderbird. Um, some of the things that you know people ask me um, every release, people ask me for color folders, which we merged. I think two releases ago. <laughs> so you can right click on a folder and change its color. Um, and, and there are a lot of things like that where um, as part of that change where we did lose some popular add-ons, we looked at them and we're like, really, this probably should have been a part of Core Thunderbird anyway. So maybe we should just make that a part of it. Um, I think that if folks who are interested in in Thunderbird, go and take a look at our um, documentation around add-ons. All of this is at developer.thunderbird.net. Um, you can see that um, we've poured a lot of resources into making a great add-ons ecosystem, and um, we're still pouring a lot of resources into that. And so our intention is to make it amazing and to make it future-proof. Like these add-ons, they're using AP, well de defined APIs, and we're adding APIs as people request them. But these things are are much um, more stable. Uh, one thing that people don't know is, you know, for a while we would an update would happen, we'd get a lot of bug reports with legacy add-ons because the add-on itself, you know, was was broken, and it might crash Thunderbird just because of the level of access it had or it might mess up the ui because it's asking to put you know an element somewhere that doesn't exist from version to version things like that and it was just a very un unstable um, place to be and uh, this allows us to move much faster move move much more effectively and if people are using the well-defined apis we don't break them arbitrarily and they don't break us arbitrarily. So it's a much healthier ecosystem, even if it was a very hard transition. Very interesting topics. Uh, the the extensions uh, thing is something uh, quite dear to me, uh, as I said, with my GNOME Foundation hat on. Um, I have very unpopular opinion in the open source world about extensions most of the time. And, and you said something that was going in that direction. Most of the time, what is in a, what is in an extension should actually be something that goes upstream, uh, a feature that is well supported, developed, known and tested uh, by, by the software. But um, sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes upstream can't keep up with the PRs. For example, people are, are submitting very good PRs, but you don't have the time to review them and, and to merge them. So having extensions, but with stable APIs uh, seems like a good compromise uh, to give users the flexibility they need and to give developers and upstream the level of control and quality they need to have on their software. Um, so very, very interesting question, actually. I, I didn't expect it to go this way. Uh, but let's not spend more time on extensions. There is another very interesting topic, a massive announcement you made. Uh, K9, what is K9 and what does it have to do with Thunderbird? Yeah, 
as you said, it's it's a very, very popular open source um, email client on Android. Um, in 2018, it must have been, I met with um, Teddy, um, that's his handle, that's what he goes by. Um, he's the maintainer for K9. We met at Bosdem. And, uh, and at the time, I just wanted to figure out if there was some way that we could uh, make it so that there was good synchronization happening so that I could tell people if you want a mobile client, you know, like you can use K9 and it will, you know, Thunderbird has this mechanism to sync the, your settings so that it's a consistent experience between desktop and mobile. And uh, I wasn't so much, although I did want to, to have a mobile client for Thunderbird. Um, I was, I just, in talking to the community and talking to the Thunderbird council at the time, I just didn't think we were at a point where the the will was there to try and do that. Um, so uh, we talked back and forth over, you know, many years, four, I guess. <laughs> and uh, eventually um, at the end of 2021, um, I just brought it up again um, with with him and with um, with ours on our side with the um, Thunderbird Council and and uh, we started talking through it and uh, he was really limited in that um, the resources <laughs> and thus the time you know he could spend dedicated on K9 was not as high as you'd like you know for an application that you use every day. Um, and uh, and so we we talked through how could we collaborate, and ultimately um, we decided the best way to collaborate would be for K9 to become a part of the Thunderbird family, and uh, and we would put more resources on it with the goal of ultimately turning it into Thunderbird um, on Android, and uh, ultimately it will be Thunderbird on Android will be very similar to K9 because it's it is K9. Um, but we think that there's a lot of Thunderbirdisms that we can uh, kind of get into K9, so it's a consistent experience between both platforms. Obviously, syncing of certain settings, and then um, and then uh, there are a lot of little things I think in K9 that even I get from K9 users every day since we announce this publicly, which are um, little nits that that Thunderbird has figured out. Um, that K9 could use some some help getting figured out, such as um, server auto discovery. So you know we have a really great mechanism for that, where even if you are using a custom domain with like Google Apps or you know some other thing, like you, most of the time we can figure out <laughs> what your server is and kind of automatically set all that up. Um, K9 is is a lot less capable of doing things like that. It tries to make some you know assumptions but um, they're usually very simple assumptions so that's something that will get markedly better um, i'm biased when i archive an email i think it should go into uh archive slash whatever the year is at the very least because that's that's how thunderbird uses it that's how thunderbird does it and i think that's right um little things like that i think we'll get into k9 and then um, I'll probably publish it this week or next week. Uh, we do have some big ticket items that we know K9 users have been asking for forever, and uh, they really align well with what Thunderbird users have been asking for for a mobile client. And so we're going to publish that, and so people will be able to see the next, I would imagine, six to eight months of work um, in that. And uh, uh, the goal is... <laughs> really productive email application that's open source and respects your your privacy and and uh, your freedom where wh whatever device you use um, so that's the ultimate goal Oops, I think I was muted for the for the stream.
Oh, uh, well, he's... Oh. <laughs> so yes, I said uh, if I was a little cheeky, I would say that K9 is just a rebranding uh, as Thunderbird Mobile uh, because of the very different code bases and, and, and that uh, they are not going to be merged anytime soon. Uh, but you still mentioned that uh, Thunderbird has a discovery mechanism uh, that is going to be shared with K9. So are you going to share snippets of code, logic, uh, resources such as designers, um, QA, et cetera? Yes. Um, not, I don't think that there will be a lot of shared code. This is something that actually held up doing anything on mobile for a long time. We had a years long, from the moment I came on to Thunderbird, which is now almost five years ago, this was the discussion is like, how are we going to port Thunderbird to mobile? And um, as a my background was, I mean, I did quite a bit of mobile development for a while. And I thought uh, my personal feeling was that would be maybe horrible. <laughs> um, and uh, just because I've seen Thunderbird's code base and I understand, you know, how it works and it didn't look like a an easy port. And uh, not only that, but um, it looked like it would be, it would make it, for a very complicated um, development story, which is like every decision going into Thunderbird desktop would be like, okay, how does this affect mobile? You know, like, does this break this? Does that break that? I just didn't sound good to me. But um, ultimately, after much, much heated discussion, um, it just it just didn't seem like the the right way to go. It seemed like it would be very, very difficult to do. Um, a one-to-one -one port. There was this idea too that we could uh, reuse some components, so we could write something in, say, um, React or or one of these other Cordova, whatever, one of these other um, uh, frameworks that allow you to uh, essentially write um, web apps. And then there's quite a bit of JavaScript uh, in Thunderbird that that, for instance, um, Pop now is is managed by a JavaScript library. And we talked about sharing code in that way. And uh, ultimately just going and using and playing around with those frameworks, um, there are um, compromises you make. Um, there are compromises in performance often. There are compromises in um, a native <laughs> feel and uh, and they have their own sets of challenges. And so um, I say all this to say that this was a discuss. Uh, at least it was before I was around too, but I, I was in it for five years. And, um, and ultimately this is where we landed and there, in that there are probably hundreds if not thousands of arguments for why to do all these different things. But we decided the best experience for users is going to be a native Android one. And then what we can do is offer our expertise around these different, you know, obviously email and uh, all of what goes into that. Obviously designers, we are going to be sharing. Um, it's not sharing anymore because it's all the same team, but designers are going to be looking at, the designers on our team are going to be looking at um, K9 as well. And, and uh, ultimately, um, we're solving the same problem and sometimes yeah we'll have to solve that on two different platforms and with different code but uh, i think that our expertise in this area um, will allow us to to do that really effectively and and um, and it's not a it's not a crazy thing like companies are doing this all the time you sometimes you maintain more than one code base i know or at least I think I know that Elements Android app is not its uh, web app, um, and so the uh, this happens, um, and we decided that was the best way to to serve users and give them a great experience, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. That's at the heart of it is if you have a mobile experience, but it's crappy because of how you created it. That's not, yeah, I'd rather have no mobile experience than a crappy one. And so this is our attempt to offer the best possible mobile experience and share the logic, like you said, and share the expertise and um, team members where 
where it's helpful and where it's useful. And, and um, I think it'll be very clear in the next year um, that this is the correct approach. And uh, ultimately, someday we're going to go over to iOS too. And, and I imagine it will be a, also another, um, this, a similar approach to what we do with K9. We're not going to adopt um, an email client because I haven't seen an open source email client on <laughs> iOS. Um, if it exists, someone ping me. But uh, you know, the um, we want whatever application is on each of these platforms to be the best possible experience to users. That is the number one thing. Everything else comes second to that. Okay, I'm really unmuted this time. Uh, it's it's a really interesting answer. Answer, and there are there is so much uh, uh, to that. Um, I think what you are trying to do is you are considering the desktop and mobile in particular, Android as two different platforms. Uh, so there is a trend on the Linux desktop to make apps adaptive or responsive, uh, as we used to say it in, in web terms. Uh, for example, KDE has the Kirigami framework for this. Uh, Gnome has libbed waiter. So just for the sake of expectations management, uh, Thunderbird, the desktop client we know today, is not going to be made adaptive. We're going to make it um, reactive and, and adaptive in the way that if you're using it, uh, so if you're using it part, you know, like you resize it to like half the screen, it should be able to be still be a functional app and you should be able to see all elements and and control it that way, which will go a long way to supporting um, mobile Linux, uh, you know, platforms. Um, I think, um, like, uh, like, uh, well, what is it now? Well, Pure OS and on mobile, and and there's there's a pretty decent list of them now. So I think that that work will help support those platforms, and I think it will be an okay experience. Of course. You know, this is where I always say, like, contributors welcome. <laughs> like, if there are contributors out there who are like, this is my area of expertise and, like, I can help Thunderbird, like, come, you know, contribute to the project. We we won't stop you. Um, the, But I, they are different platforms, and I'm going to treat them like different platforms because desktop is not the same, especially with email, it's not the same use case as mobile. Your mobile, your, you people do. But most people are not writing really long memorandums, you know, to go out company wide on their mobile device, unless it's like a fr frantic thing. Um, they're not doing the same. It's not the same. You're not using your mobile device for the same the same way with email as you do whenever you're on the desktop. You're sitting down. You're being very thoughtful, usually spending a lot of time on your you know, your correspondence when you're sitting there on desktop. And um, this is another place where I think from an engineering standpoint, you're just like shared code base, no duplicate effort. Like that will be the best way to approach this problem. And I do have a heart for that. Like I do feel that, you know, in 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 a real way. But I, I think that, um, you know, Android is not, um, desktop Linux or desktop, you know, it's not Windows, it's not Mac OS. There are different expectations people bring to that. And I think it, it allows us to have the folks working on desktop, they're very focused on what is the best desktop experience um, for Thunderbird. And the people who are focused on our mobile effort are like, what is the best mobile experience, email experience? It allows us to really stay focused on those products where they exist and they are different products. I, I, they will be, they will have the same name for the purpose of discovery, for the purpose of people who are using Thunderbird on their desktop, they love it. They go to mobile, they're like, I want that same experience. Okay, you can type in Thunderbird, you'll, you'll discover it. But they are still different products because the, plat I mean, this is so much different than the computer I'm sitting at. It's, there's no keyboard here. The screen is smaller. Your interface is touch. Like there's just a t entirely different set of expectations.
people bring to that. And I want to make sure that that when we need to, the desktop experience is very is a very solid desktop experience and the mobile experience is a, clearly a mobile experience, but it's the best it can be on that platform. So once again, another long answer, but but it's like key to how we're thinking about this and, and how I hope that community and our users can also they can at least see how we how we got there. That's very interesting. I, I like that there are uh, actually different opinions on that uh, because I know that uh, both KD and GNOME developers are trying to think their applications both for mobile and desktop, uh, but it's it's really something very polarizing. Uh, in some cases you can, in some cases you can't. Uh, in the case of an email client, I don't know. I don't have an opinion. I, I it's uh, it's something very polarizing, and I definitely understand that Thunderbird wants to be very different on desktop and on mobile uh, because you don't have the same expectations. Uh, talking about desktop and mobile. Uh, you have in your roadmap sync between Thunderbird desktop and mobile. The IMAP protocol is already what is used to distribute email and to synchronize email across clients. So what new are you bringing to the table? Yeah, so it's it's a lot of it is settings. And um, for instance, some of them will be very little things like tags on mobile. They should be the same, you know, this is something that's supported in IMAP, but things like, okay, what color is the to-do tag? You know, like things little, these little user, you, the user experience things. Um, there are there are a number of settings in just how your inbox behaves that I think could be um, interesting. What way do you want your email sorted in your inbox? Like, do you, you know, I think there's only true one true way, which is um, the most recent down um, with the bottom being like the, the furthest back, but that's not how every user uses, you know, Thunderbird or uses um, uh, K9 mail. So I'm, I might not be a customizable K9 mail, but the, um, but those should be the same. Um, so when you go between the two platforms, unless you purposely set one one way and, and one the other, um, the there are all the all those little things I think that like you know we're working right now on folders, uh, displaying folders better in K9, but like you colored those folders on desktop, they should be the same color on mobile. There's all these little things I think that are settings, you know, for the email application itself that need to be, um, or should be, it should be possible to sync them between the two clients. Um, IMAP does a lot of work, but it doesn't always do everything. Um, you know, filters, for instance, the, technically you can use Steve um, to sync filters, but not every um, email service supports that. And so, that doesn't mean just because your email service supports it, at least in my opinion, that doesn't mean you shouldn't still have those same filters in both places. Um, so we're gonna pick up the slack um, for for services there. Um, and I think that as we as time goes on and we really like get heavily into this work, I think we'll find a, nov a number of a number of things that are useful to have synced in both places. So, um, so that's my answer currently. And then in a month, it'll probably or two, it'll probably be an even more complicated, but also detailed um, answer. I think that we'll probably have to write some blog post or something about you know how we're making these decisions and and what our thought process is there as we get into it. So you are going to build on top of email, uh, on top of the email standards, but something that goes beyond that. I am thinking out loud, but could it make sense for the Thunderbird team to contribute to new standards uh, to make 
these things possible beyond Thunderbird and Thunderbird Mobile, but uh, something that every email client could do. Yeah, I think we we do need to be more involved in the um, updating and in the creation of new new standards. In the past, I think we haven't played that large of a role because we were a small team. But now we're not. We're not. We're still compared to some people. We're still a small team, but we're not. We're not tiny anymore. <laughs> um, so I think that it makes sense that we would engage more with the larger community over the creation of of standards and um so i think we will get more into that uh i think this year will be we're still trying to get our house finished getting our house together but um i think in, in the next few years we'll definitely participate more on that and we do have conversations um with other folks like fast mail you know they're very much um proponents of the jmap standard and um we do share our opinions there. Um, there are other bodies. Um, CalConnect, which um, plays a part in the creation of the CalDev standard, we're a part of that, and we share our opinions there. Um, but the, uh, but we could do more. Um, and some of that's resource constraints. Uh, so to the audience, if you want to support Thunderbird, give .thunderbird.net. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we would like to participate more. So you said that you were uh, more than you used to be. Uh, I guess this has something to do with your business model. Just a last que question on mobile before we move to the organizational aspects of Thunderbird. You touched briefly on an iOS possibility. Uh, so is this somewhere on the roadmap for 2022 beyond? No idea. No, it, it'll be beyond. Um, I can't see anything happening um, before 2023 and even 2023 is going to be difficult. Um, iOS is just a different platform and it's, it's a platform that's even more restrictive than Android. And so our approach to that has to be even more, uh, <laughs> you really need to continue thinking and planning that. And, uh, it's not going to be an easy lift. Um, you know, sometimes I think about just creating a new repo on the on GitHub for this and just saying community come help like help us get started here because there's no prior art you know nothing we can use besides of course um the thunderbird work as a template and the canine work as a template but, the, but we're gonna have to build that from currently i think we're gonna have to build that from scratch and so that's going to be a, a heck of an effort and so um i want to do it very in my mind it's very high on the priority list, but it's also very hard. So it's it's going to be, a, it's, we're going to have to figure that out. And uh, as I will try and share news as soon as I kind of come to some kind of conclusion with our team and with our community around how we're going to do that. Priorities when you have a limited budget and limited resources. Uh, I know what this is about. Uh, talking about limited resources, we can talk about the business model. But for that, we've been talking about Thunderbird since the beginning. But I, when I was much younger and probably had a few less kilograms, uh, it used to be called Mozilla Thunderbird. Is it just Thunderbird? Is it still Mozilla Thunderbird nowadays? Mm. You've been reading the internet. Um, it's, it's Mozilla Thunderbird. We're still a part of Mozilla. Um, we do live in our own um, legal entity that exists under the Mozilla Foundation, but it is it is Thunderbird's legal entity, MZLA, um, is what it's called, MZLA Technologies. And um, we moved there uh, because of multiple reasons. Um, but one of them was because uh, we were growing, our revenue was growing, we needed the ability to kind of move quickly and move and, you know, hire people to adjust how we organize the team and everything. And, and um, there were a ton of reasons, but uh, having our own legal entity has allowed us to really uh, create our own, you know, way of doing things and, and move faster and move more effectively. And, and to be quite honest, part of my 
reason for wanting to do it was um, I think that uh, our values as a team, as a community, which the, I, as I said at the beginning, the council the, plays a very large role in our operations, not just in, in the Thunderbird project, but also um, they're one of the stakeholders for the, for the Thunderbird, for our company, for, you know, the legal entity we exist in. And so um, the community has a large say in what we do uh, just from a business development or business planning perspective. Um, but one thing I've always wanted to do is because our values are, are I think, good, you know, privacy, freedom, respecting, open source. I think that we should be offering services to our users that make them more productive, that make them more, um, that make using, make communicating easier um, and also that follow those values. Um, and, uh, and so I'd like to eventually be able to roll out, you know, services that we offer to our users, of course, you know, we would have to charge to pay for the ability to run those services, but the, um, and we're not going to like use advertising or something to pay for those. So um, the, my hope eventually as an organization is that, is that we can, you know, offer our users um, services that align with their, their values. And we couldn't do that in any other way, except for in our own entity. Oh, you're muted for me. Oh, it's muted evening. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it, do, it does make sense uh, for Thunderbird to, ha to have its own entity and to provide services. Uh, because as much as I like privacy and as much as I like to get everything local on my computer, sometimes uh, services are just, are just convenient. Um, so it does make sense to charge users for services so you don't have to sell the data, for example, too. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense before uh, getting to to a more active development uh, thunderbird has uh, has had ups and downs uh, it used to be in active development uh, it was the the firefox of email um, then it used to be a little bit more dormant and now it seems to be very very active uh, with many things going on what happened um so i'm gonna talk a little bit about just the realities of paying a team to work on a piece of software. Um, I know, uh, at least in the open source community, this is something that is like kind of um, not the most popular topic and it doesn't make me the most popular person to just talk about the realities of, of um, what it takes to do, uh, to run a really big software project. Um, I would love to live in a world where our community contributions were organized well enough, but also at a scale high enough that we didn't need to have, you know, money to hire developers to work on Thunderbird. Unfortunately, um, even some of the best projects I've seen still need um, people paid sitting at the desk who are there to work on stuff. Sometimes that is like either time sensitive or whatever, or just to move stuff along at a pace that keeps the software relevant to um, what users need. And um, when I came in, we were, we I think we had we had a somewhat healthy donation base. We had users donating, and we I think the first year I was on, we had about seven hundred thousand dollars in donations for that year. Um, That's not which, much. It's not much. Yes, exactly. It's not much, um, especially for 20 million users. For instance, in 2019, Slack had 20 million monthly active users, and they had they made four forty three billion dollars. I don't know. I have to look this up again. No, no, not forty three billion. Four hundred and thirty seven million. Someone will put, pop it in the chat. Um, but uh, the so same user numbers, but somebody's doing way way better than we were. Um, and so, uh, and Thunderbird is very, it's a very sticky application. People use it, who are using it, if you talk to them, they're using it all day. Like they have it open all day. They're constantly referring back to it. So it's not like the amount of value it offers is quite high if someone's using it, you know, 
five to eight hours a day. Um, but the amount of value we capture back from our users is like, you know, the seven hundred thousand dollars of in donations is like point zero zero, you know, two percent like of people actually donating who are our users. And so um the first thing that I thought was we need to tell users that we're in danger because Thunderbird was in danger when I came on. I was an employee, but I was one of two when I came on and uh, it did not look good. Um, and now you're 20? 20, we'll be 25 here shortly. Um, but how I, did you do that? Yeah. Well, the the first thing is I, I said, we have to let users know and I know it might be annoying, but we need to put it in their face that like, this is the only way that we're being sustained. Even the ser like the server costs alone, things that just create, build and, and distribute Thunderbird is expensive. And so like, we need to let them know, like, even if we want to remain in maintenance mode, we do need support from, from you. And, um, that really resonated. We saw the next year, I think we saw 1.2 million in donations. The next year it was um, 1.8. The next year it was 2.5. And this year we're on we're on track for three something. And so, um, so the, it really resonated. And we just made sure to get kind of in front of users' faces and let them know Thunderbird is supported by you. <laughs> you know, like if you get value from Thunderbird, please consider donating. And that allowed us to come quite a long way. And we're getting better at explaining the situation to users, which I think you have to figure out how to do. Because you don't want to be like constantly annoying users, but at the same time, like uh, you, you, if your user numbers aren't changing, but your donations, you know, drop for a couple months, if that's a problem with like reminding users that. You're, you know, like you're here, you're using the application, please, you know, help us out. Um, I do worry about the sustainability of open source software in general. Um, and I think a lot about it because I think a lot about Thunderbird situation. A donation is one of these things where um, it's kind of a decision that is based a lot on, on just how you feel at any given moment you download the software you know like you don't like you're sitting there you see the donation appeal you're like okay well you know maybe i don't have my credit card near me right now or maybe um you know i just broke up with my girlfriend like i you know it's, there's there's no um uh even though we're doing quite well with donations there's no consistency there. I mean, there's some consistency throughout the year. During the end of the year, more people give. People are more in the giving spirit then. But it's but it's um, very hard to predict, and it's very difficult. And that and I think about that for a lot of open source projects I know who, you know, since we since I started doing this and have seen Thunderbird um, get more successful through this strategy, I've had a lot of open source projects reach out to me and ask like, okay, how can we do something similar? And um, it's uh, it's difficult because there are projects out there that have, we've seen this, that have millions of users or maybe they don't have millions of users, but they have a few big users like Amazon and Google and so on, but they can't, who are using them, you know, for some of their key marquee products and things like that. But they, they're, it's just one guy who occasionally gets people essentially dropping tips <laughs> you know, in a, in a bucket. And, and that really worries me. And so, but I think that this is a problem that our community exacerbates because anytime someone tries to monetize their open source project, it's still open source, but they're trying to find ways to monetize it. They get a lot of hate for that. And I think that's kind of wrong because um, the reality of our world is that, you know, these people who are pouring, you know, a lot of these guys or gals working on these things in in a lot of cases not making any money or making very little money on it is just not sustainable if you want the software to stick around there needs to be some 
sustainable way for the person to get value out of the time that they're spending on the on the application or the library or whatever and and so yeah right so the, this is you're highlighting uh, very important topics um one of them is well in particular the sustainability it drags all the other topics uh, one of them is the need for a cultural shift uh, in open source i think we are getting on the verge to the second big cultural shift of open source the first one was that open source was made by engineers for engineers and it was nerd things and all open source software looked really terrible and <laughs> And in the early days of open source, people tended to see designers as as people just doing nice drawings and painting colors of software, when there is a lot more to that. Uh, as, as we have said, you are doing a facelift on Thunderbird because it has real impact on users, on real life people who are not necessarily engineers and who are not necessarily interested in the open source aspect of Thunderbird, but who just want a product that works. Um, I think the second cultural shift we need in open source is is in the open source uh, consuming community, I'd say, rather than in the open source producing community. And that is that the producers of open source software need to have a salary, need to have money to eat, and that it's not dirty for them to monetize uh, their project. In the open source world, it's easy when you are selling to uh, enterprise, because when you are selling to enterprise, uh, you can sell support contracts that most enterprise will be happy to pay for because they want to have SLAs. They want you to be there quickly if something bad happens. Um, when you are doing general public oriented software, uh, and this is really something that resonates with me with my GNOME hat on, uh, this is something that you are producing for end users. Most end users just expect the thing to be free and, and to work and to be somehow self-sustainable. So. It's fascinating for me uh, to learn, because I didn't know about that, uh, that just by telling people, we are not sustainable, we are in danger. If, if you have value, uh, if you get value from the software, please send a tip. And that it works, it's, I, I find it fascinating. I, I didn't expect it to work. I'm going to prod you uh, after the show to get a few, few ad advice on how to do that uh, for, for other projects. Uh, one of the uh, things, uh, one of the next questions I would have is, as I said, enterprise most of the time is willing to pay. Uh, if I use Thunderbird and see the project is in danger, as a personal user, I'm going to be, oh crap, that would be really bad if Thunderbird does not exist anymore, but there are other projects. If I'm a company, uh, if I'm an organization, I, it could be public services, I don't know if Thunderbird is deployed, uh, in public institutions, in governments, in, in schools, it's going to have a bigger impact on, on me if Thunderbird is not working anymore. Do your donations come mostly from individuals or do you have organizations uh, in your donors? It's, um, I, uh, surely there are organizations in our donors. Um, they, it's very hard sometimes to tell. Um, just based on what we get for like a kind of like a receipt, you know, for someone having paid contributed via PayPal or, or otherwise. Um, we are trying to, we're, you know, we still need, I think, grow the team a little more around engaging with enterprises because that's a whole different ball game with a whole different timeline, different, you know, there's, there's many, of course, contracts, like you said, SLAs, things like that, that we are, we do not have at the moment, a lot of talent on our team around that. And uh, that will be a challenge, but it is something that we're working on because we do know a very large Thunderbird installations out there. You know, we're talking 200,000 um, people in an organization using Thunderbird who, who could probably benefit from, from our support or at least from engagement with us. Um, but it's uh, it's not trivial to stand up that, and uh, and I do think I I do think that we should find ways to create a value exchange relationship 
with our normal users because I still think they're the lion's share of our user base. And those, those still might be businesses, but you know, a lot of folks I talk to when I just randomly pick someone out of the user base who I know is a user and I reach out to them and I say, what do you do? What do you, whatever. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm working a three or four person accounting, you know, like they, you know, they're like, you know, either they can be individual users or they can be students or they could be in many cases like small business owners or, or, or part of small business, which Thunder makes sense for um, because it's, it's a great tool um, that's obviously very cheap if it's free. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I can see why we make it into so many of those orgs, but we do need to set up some way to do value exchange with those people to, to where it's not just um, give us money when you feel like it, but it's more like, here's some things we can give you that will make your life easier. And in exchange, you know, you can give us whatever, like $2, $3, $5 a month. Um, and I do think that would be healthy for us, for our project, to make sure that we're here five years from now and that we're doing well. Um, that will be a massive change if we do pursue that. And it will be, I think, difficult for at least some members of the open source community to to grasp why you know we would go that direction. But I'm telling everyone right now, this is why, because it, um, donations are not the most sustainable of ways to exist, especially as we look into potentially going into a global recession. You know, each day I think about, is that going to impact? And I think it probably will. Is that going to impact people's ability to just do these one-off donations? And so, um, so sustainability is, at, is a, it takes up like 30 to 40% of <laughs> my brain power um, almost every day. Um, but I am extraordinarily grateful that just by telling our users that we were in danger, that we were able to get to a place where um, obviously if donations drop off tomorrow, we will be in danger. But like, we're at least, I think if this continued for for the next few years, we would be in a very, in a pretty sustainable place. We wouldn't be able to do everything we want to do, but we can do most of what we need to do. Okay, so what you're describing sounds to me a bit like you are trying to make a pay what you want company. Uh, you are trying to, to say, uh, this is the value we provide, uh, pay what you can, pay what you want, uh, which is nice. Uh, I am wondering if you have potential partnerships uh, with some organizations um, where they could sponsor Thunderbird uh, for specific sets of features or to advance a specific cause, for example, if Thunderbird could be a piece uh, in, a, in a more general uh, scheme. Yeah, I think that ultimately we'll get there um, with um, sponsorship or just support contracts for, for enterprises. I don't know if it'll happen this year, but I think that, that we're at least having conversations now, which is what usually the conversation goes like, is like, okay, well, we know how to deploy Thunderbird because we've been using it for 10, 15 years, whatever. And like, but we do have things that really, you know, we would really like to see changed or, you know, um, for our use case, maybe there's like a, a custom, an add-on we can make for them or a patch that can be applied locally for their org that, that solves that problem. Or if it's useful for everyone, of course, it can be created to go into core. And I do think that will be, a part of our sustainability in the future, um, but it'll take time uh, to stand that up. And uh, but we're working on that. And and uh, if you're out there, any of you listeners, and uh, you have and you're you're working in an organization where Thunderbird is um, widely used, um, we'd really love to to have conversations with you about that and better understand how we can you know, have those types of relationships. Yeah, Ryan is in the, in the Open Tech Will Save Us room. Uh, so uh, prod him if you, if, you, if you want to help. Talking about helping, if I can afford it and if I want to donate money to Thunderbird because it's been a lifesaver for many years or just because I want to support the project, where should I throw my money? Yeah, um, give.thunderbird.net. Um, 
you can it would there it's all localized that we can accept money from most places on the planet um and we really appreciate and if you can afford it and you do love thunderbird um we don't have that many people who do recurring donations surprisingly for the amount of income we have um it's it's very few people who actually do recurring donations but if you are able to throw three four five bucks at us a month um as a recurring donation that is very very helpful and and we get to look at those and we get to say okay we we think it's very likely we can count on that (laughs) these donations being here you know in the future um so yeah i encourage folks to to go over and 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 give there and of course anyone listening to this if you're in the matrix room you know um and and uh just as a giving a little value back you know you can you can always hit me up um you know our forums are for most people listening to this are probably not that um alien to them uh and so come and participate in our community and and share your thoughts and and um yeah Talking about uh, participating, if if I can't afford uh, to uh, spend money on Firefox, on Firefox, on Thunderbird, sorry, uh, but I still want to contribute to Thunderbird um, because it's an amazing project. What are my options? What can I do? Can I uh, do some development of code, some QA, some translations? All of, all of the above. Um, we we use for you know, of course, going in reverse order. Um, we use Pontoon um, as part of the Mozilla infrastructure. So I think it's pontoon.mozilla.org. Um, you can go over and help with our translation. And of course, Firefox translations are also there too, but you can search um, for what you want to translate. That is always very helpful. Um, we do have, if there's anyone out there who speaks Japanese or um, what's the other one? Japanese or Polish. Um, currently, we have some translations that uh, are waiting for a willing translator to come by and, and help us with. Um, what what else? Uh, for QA, um, we we do all that on Bugzilla, um, with the exception of K9. K9 um, is at a normal GitHub repo, and um, you can go over and participate there. And, and just, just filing really good bugs, you know, and I think most of your uh, listeners probably will know how to do that to some extent, but just detailed, this is steps to reproduce. That always the, helps immensely. <laughs> uh, so that's that's very useful. And also, of course, we just rolled out 102. So testing all those features, seeing if there are any bugs that you can find, that's all very helpful. And then uh, development, if you go to developer.thunderbird.net, you can learn how to engage in the Thunderbird development process. Um, you can also learn to write add-ons there if, if that's more your speed. Um, and uh, we always could use more developers. Um, being open source doesn't necessarily mean that you get a ton of people constantly coming in. And Thunderbird is a very large code base. And I acknowledge that it is quite hard to go from knowing nothing about the Thunderbird code base to contributing, but um, but we could really use um, developers who are willing to to dive into specific projects and, and do stuff. And if you have a pain point, you know, the best thing you can do if you're a developer is to fix that pain point and submit that to us, you know, and uh, uh, we don't get as many of those as you might imagine. And, and uh, we'd love to see that situation improve. The good old scratch your itch. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's large code bases can be a, a little scary sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. I skipped a, a question at some point, and it's a shame because we had a discussion earlier about uh, standards, and there was a very interesting question about JMAP. So IMAP is the uh, standard for email. JMAP is a standard. I believe Fastmail is one of the main companies uh, pushing for JMAP. Do you intend to support uh, JMAP in Thunderbird? Does it make sense? And what does it bring? What does it bring? Sorry. Yeah. So first off, Fastmail has been a long time um, supporter of Thunderbird. They they provide us with a lot of um, helpful resources. 
Um, and uh, we be and we believe in the JMAP standard. We very much want to implement it. Um, it is on it is on the roadmap. It's there's in that I I don't like calling anything on the roadmap that doesn't have a specific delivery date on the roadmap. But it is it is there. Like it's we're trying to stick it somewhere at the moment as far as the work goes. Um, and so. Uh, I think that we will, if we don't deliver it in, in the 2023 release, I can't see it going beyond the 2024 release, but I would guess we'll see. But I, I think in the next year, it's, it has a, a likely chance of making it in, um, not a 100% chance, but we'd like to support it. We think it's a great standard. We, <laughs> we really like what it enables. Um, so the we just need to find a time to get it if someone wants to come in and and write that patch like please come in like that is what we're waiting on is someone to to write support for jmap and uh, it's no it's not no it's not an easy task but um we're trying to you know place it on the priority list at the moment so if you are a developer and want to add JMAP to Thunderbird, you are welcome. If you are a company and you want to sponsor JMAP addition to Thunderbird, please reach out to Ryan. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so, and maybe we'll be able to, you know, maybe we'll be able to get uh, Fastmail in a room and, and see if we we can collaborate on this. But it's... Um, it's it is something that we'd like like to support and we'd like to see more providers supporting jmap and so and so that's something too if there's anyone out there working at an email service provider who's listening um you know this looks like a very great you know standard we should have more more service providers um uh, offering um that as an option Talking about that, uh, what what specifically about JMAP uh, are you excited about? What more does it bring uh, as compared to IMAP? I think that just looking through the spec, there are a lot of like, um, you of course you'd put me on the spot with like calling out specific one, um, but the but I think that there are just a lot of little things that are um, quality of life things that that should be a part of IMAP and could be. I think that if we there's nothing wrong too with updating IMAP. Like that could be, and some people say like IMAP with extensions, you know, is, is uh, can be really quite competitive. And so, um, what specifically, um, you know, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I I do know that there have been times that we've been having discussions <laughs> about some IMAPism. And someone always pipes up and is like, this isn't a problem in JMAP. And uh, so, you know, I'll have to I'll have to do a little um, research and have that ready for the next time I get asked that question. But I but I do know that there are a lot of quality of life things that that are supported in JMAP that should be in IMAP, but they're just not. Right. Uh, it's not the first time I, I hear somebody saying uh, this is a problem with IMAP that we don't have with JMAP. But I'm not an expert, so I, I, I'm not going to blame you for not uh, pointing a specific feature that, that uh, exists with JMAP and not with IMAP. Uh, do you have any final thoughts uh, you would like uh, to tell us about to conclude the episode, anything we didn't cover? Uh, no, I would, I would just encourage people, which we did um, just a little bit ago, to... If you if you care about Thunderbird, um, you can support us with the donation, or you know even better, come in and and participate in the development process in some way. Um, all of that really makes a big difference and helps us um, stay sustainable, but also tackle these big th pro problems that <laughs> exist in Thunderbird, whether it's an outdated UX or something, you know, or a specific bug that you struggle with, like all of it helps. And, um, and we're not getting, you know, we're not getting Mozilla search money from Google. We don't, we're not supported at all by that. And so we really are reliant on the people in our community, the people, our user base to continue making Thunderbird an excellent, an excellent project. And I, and I think that it is rapidly 
getting better. But if you want to help us continue that, um, please um, come and participate in some way or, or consider giving us a, a donation. Awesome. Uh, what? Oh, looks like my remote is broken. I'm using my iPhone as a remote. I could not switch the, <laughs> the view. Um, well, thank you very much, Ryan, for joining us and for being part of a vibrant uh, Thunderbird community and even being part of uh, one of the main people making Thunderbird visible and, and, and vibrant. Uh, we need, obviously, many different skills to make software and beyond software projects happen. I'm really happy that Thunderbird has a person who is trying to change mentalities and trying to raise money and try to bring the most difficult kind of change, systemic changes to a project to make it more sustainable. So it was very interesting. Uh, it was very fascinating for you, for, for me to have you here. I loved all the answers to the sustainability project, which is a very, very old project uh, in open source, a very, very old problem in uh, open source software. Uh, Thunderbird is my go-to client for emails and calendaring on Linux. This is not going to change. I'm happy to see a fresh layer of paint on it and beyond the layer of paint, I'm happy to see the foundational UX changes that you are bringing to get modernity uh, and to get Thunderbird out of the way when I'm trying to do things. So I'm really excited to do. I've been refreshing my flat packs uh, the whole day to get the, the 102 release. I did not have it yet. I can't wait. Uh, it's it's I'll tap, really I'll tap shoulder. We'll get that. We'll get that rolling. I'll tap. Some cool. <laughs> yeah. <Woo -hoo. laughs> uh, to the to the rest of the audience, if you use Thunderbird and can afford it, I invite you to please donate to the project. Open source needs a strong supportive community to thrive and to compete with closed commercial projects uh, who are charging users. You are not being charged, so if you can please support. I'll see you all in a month on July 27. I didn't decide on the theme for the next episode yet, but it might be platforms. Have a nice day or a nice evening and take care of each other. See you around. Thank you. <laughs>